Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 17th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on each Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we are in a very brief eye of the state's fiscal hurricane. How have we gotten here and what happens next? Second, at the end of this process, someone is going to pay taxes. The only question is who? And third, what we should know as we head toward the nation's next federal fiscal crisis. And now, let's join Michael. Uh, we talk about the weekly top three, and uh, today is no different. So let's, uh, let's take a crack at uh, starting. And uh, number one today has to do, of course, with the governor's budget. We are in that brief, I think you said the eye of the storm, right before the hurricane or right in the middle of the hurricane before we jump back in through the eye wall on the other side. Let's talk about that. Yeah, I, I, I do liken it to the being in the eye of the hurricane. We've gone through the first phase, the first storm um, uh, that was the regular session, uh, and now we're sort of sitting in this lull that's not going to last too long, but sort of this lull in between uh, the, the regular session and then what's about to hit us uh, uh, in the next phase. And it's not just it's not just the special session. The special session will play part of that. But we've got we got a whole series of things that are going to drop um, fairly quickly here. The vetoes, the governor is going to act on the operating budget. He said he said there's not going to be layoffs. We're not or there's not going to be mass layoffs. We're not going to close the budget, close uh, the government down on July one. So he must be intending to act on the operating budget in some fashion before then. Uh, everybody, everybody is anticipating a raft of vetoes, uh, at least to spending categories. I continue to anticipate some sort of veto related to time. That is. Uh, uh, saying we're going to have an operating budget for 60 days, but that gets put back into the special session as well. You guys need to, you didn't finish your job by dealing with the PFD, and so you need to deal with, with the total budget, put the PFD in there and deal with the total budget. Um, so we're going to have vetoes coming up. We've got the PFD that's still sitting out there. Uh, we've got the issue about the reverse sweep that we can dig into if you, if you want to. Basically, the reverse sweep is a is an issue that uh, relates to the capital budget in some respects. Uh, we have a bunch of savings accounts that, uh, by constitution, sort of empty out on uh, on June 30 every year, and then uh, usually in the in the capital budget, there's a vote to to reinstate uh, those spending or those savings accounts. So there's something to draw on. Uh, those they're available to draw on when you get into the operating or when you get into the year. Uh, some of them fund the operating budget, um, and without a two-thirds vote to to do the reverse sweep, which the legislature did not do, uh, those accounts will drain out into the into the CBR um, constitutional budget reserve and won't be taken back out and and won't be reversed back out. So. As Senator von Imhoff says, that'll open up holes in the operating budget. There won't be funding for some categories in the operating budget. And then the biggest thing, uh, what may turn out to be the biggest thing, although the vetoes, PFD, and reverse sweep will be will certainly be big ones. Uh, the biggest thing that's that's sort of on the horizon right now is the capital budget. There's a increasing concern uh, 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 about what's going to happen with the capital budget. The legislature passed the capital budget in the closing days of the regular session but they didn't fund it. 
uh, because they chose to use the House chose to use funding that relies on the CBR. The CBR takes a two thirds vote, um, and the minority uh, House minority didn't for it, which deprived the two thirds vote, blocked the two thirds vote, and wouldn't really get the PFD. And so the capital budget didn't get funded, and the capital budget's uh, sitting out there. Uh, uh, beginning to cause issues. You see, there's an article in the ADN today. Uh, one of the one of the interesting things I saw uh, was a was a tweet uh, on Twitter from Associated General Contractors, uh, one of the trade groups, uh, that said the legislature need or government needs to do quote whatever it takes close quote to have a capital budget. They're concerned about <laughs> uh, spending for. Uh, for for their for their projects, sure, um, sure. And the we, capital budget, the state capital budget, is tied to the to, to federal uh, to the federal match that we get on on transportation. Um, basically, we spend ten. The get federal government gives us ninety uh, percent of the of the of the transportation budget um, through the highway uh, highway funding. And absent uh, absent the state spending the ten, we don't get the ninety. And so there's a big concern about. Uh, about what's going to happen, not only from a state budget standpoint, but what's going to happen from a federal budget standpoint. So, you you look you look at where we're where we've been uh, a big storm uh, during the regular session. You look at where we're headed, which may even turn into a bigger storm, uh, given the vetoes, the PFD issue, the reverse sweep issue, and the capital budget. And we're sort of sitting here in this lull between the two. Um, uh, those of us who follow this who follow this sort of girding up. For the intensity of the storm that's uh, that's going to hit us uh, uh, beginning the next few days. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, Brad, let's—I mean, you just laid out a whole bunch of stuff here, so let's try and unpack it from the beginning a little bit. You mentioned this time frame, uh, the time, the time portion of the veto. Uh, I've seen some skepticism from people on that saying that, well, if he only vetoed a portion of it or, you know, let's say he vetoed it down to a fifth or a sixth of the overall budget and then came back and told the legislature, all right, we've got just enough for 60 days worth of funding here or whatever. Um, You go ahead and get the job done. There's been some speculation that they would basically just. Uh, I mean, I don't know if ignore him is the word or or anything like that, but I mean, it, you, you say that there's that there's talk of this or that there's there's kind of a hint of this. You you have a you have a percentile. You want to give me odds? What do you you know? T- tell me what your thoughts are on this. And have you heard some of this pushback on the idea of reducing it down to a time frame versus a line item for specific targets or things like that? Uh, yes, I've heard some of the pushback. Here here's the. Um... Here, here's the the bigger issue that that feeds into. The bigger issue is how do you get leverage on the legislature to to fulfill the PFD? I mean, the governor has said that we're going to have that his his agenda is to have a full statutory PFD. The legislature fairly clearly has said, at least the House has fairly clearly said, we're not going that way. Uh, and the Senate is sort of bollocked up, tied up in in, in whatever the Senate's doing. Um, and so, how do you how do you get from here, where you've got a legislature that's recalcitrant, a governor that's insistent? How do you get from here uh, to the to the to, to the passage of a full PFD or or some resolution of that? Um, and and that's that's really the issue. If you can't, if you don't have pressure on the legislature, uh, then is the legislature ever going to enact a full statute? Is the House ever going to enact a full statutory PFD? Some people. Uh, are are saying well the capital budget's enough pressure that that withholding the um, the minority votes not not allowing a, a a draw from the CBR and withholding the minority votes on the capital budget uh, is enough to create that pressure and so we don't need to worry about using the operating budget. Some people say uh, holding withholding votes on the reverse sweep is enough to create pressure uh, on the legislature to to force them to rethink the uh, $3,000. The problem with both of those is there's a way around that. On the capital budget, the only reason that that the that the minority has pressure or has has leverage is because the majority is proposing to fund it through a CBR draw. They don't have to do that. They can go to the earnings reserve, which you can which you can draw on a, on majority vote, not a not a two thirds vote. They could they could 
go to some of the other savings accounts um, and and draw on those uh, to, uh, to to fund the capital budget. The reverse sweep you can also you can also step past the reverse sweep in the same way. Now they don't want to do that. They, the majority doesn't want to go to the earnings reserve uh, because that then would result in an overdraw of the earnings reserve. Um, uh, above the 5.25 percent that's provided by statute, and they say they don't want to they don't want to overdraw the earnings reserve. So may, maybe maybe they've they've put a box on themselves. The majority's put a box on themselves enough that the minority's uh, refusal to vote on the CBR is enough pressure to get the PFD. But um, uh, there are ways around uh, that that pressure on the uh, on the CBR vote. Fairly easy ways around that pressure on the CBR vote, and I can easily see the majority saying, "Well, the minority's trying to hold up government, and so we're just going to uh, we're just going we're going to have to do this to keep government functioning. We're going to have to do this for a capital budget. We're going to have to do this because the majority won't or the minority won't deal with us on the reverse sweep." And essentially, just end run uh, the minority's leverage. So, if if that's available to to the to the to the majority, then how does the governor create other pressure on the majority to uh, uh, to to enact the PFD? And to me, the only way uh, the, the the way that makes the most sense is to have is to keep the operating budget essentially up in the air. While the PFD issue still stands out there, that gives the governor some ability to deal between what he would do on the operating budget uh, and the PFD, make some potentially concessions on the operating budget in order to in order to get a full PFD, keep that keep that leverage up there, and in any event, keep the leverage on the legislature to do whatever it takes to get an operating budget uh, in place. Because there's really no end run if the governor has time limited the operating budget. There's really no end run on that. I mean, that's what the that's what the governor's done by veto. So it's a question. It's a question about what the governor. If the governor thinks he needs leverage, I think he does, but but right. he may not. If the governor thinks he needs leverage, and what's the effective leverage uh, to get the PFD done? Um, you know, it, once if he were to make the line item vetoes that that everyone anticipates he's going to make in the line item veto, but then let that operating budget go into effect by for a year just veto down the amounts, not time limited, then the operating budget's essentially done and the legislature can go, well, you know, you've done what you've done on the operating budget. We can't change that. Uh, we feel no pressure. There's no room. You, you could argue there's some, there's not, there's not the same amount of room to, to deal with the governor between the operating budget and the, and the PFD. Um, and, and so he's sort of given up that leverage. So I, you know, yes, I've heard the pushback on the issue but my re my my reply to that in the discussions I've had is okay. Where's the where's the leverage then? Where where's the governor going to get the leverage to uh, to to get the legislature to confront uh, the PFD? And as I said, the, the 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 response I usually get back is the capital budget. Well, the capital budget in the reverse sweep. But as I said, there's ways around that. Right. Um, and it's just a question of whether <laughs> you, you know it's a, it's a gaming issue about whether you think the legislature would use those ways around it or whether the, the, the CBR votes for the capital budget and the reverse sweep are, are, are an effective block. Well, and I think it's how he frames it. Does he frame it as the legislature is the one that hasn't done their job? And so any kind of potential for government, future government shutdowns or things like that can be laid at their feet. Uh, I mean, I think there's there's definitely some politics and some gamesmanship that is li that is, you know, laid in on this. But. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm looking at this and saying, yeah, this this is a good good potential. I would like to see it. I I don't know if the governor is going to decide to do that or not. He's already eliminated and took off the table the idea of vetoing the entire budget, um, and so I guess we'll you know we'll see we'll see how it lays out on this one. Um, yeah, it's 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 uh, to me it's a real simple mantra from the government governor side. It's you haven't finished your job. Yeah. And I'm not going we're not going to have I'm not going to let you get away with just doing a partial job and, and then sort of sitting there spinning on the PFD uh, uh, forever uh, uh, because because I let you get away with doing a part of your job. You're going to do your job. Uh, I'm going to wait for you to do your full job before before you know we resolve resolve this thing going forward. And I think that's a fairly simple, straightforward message from the governor. I um I mean, I yes, I recognize there are people that push back on that, but but this is a this is a decision point 
uh, that the governor's got completely in his hands, assuming he's got 16 to uphold him in the legislature, that the governor's got completely in his hands. It's the only decision point the governor's got completely in his hands. I mean, he can't control where things go on the capital budget. He can't control things where things go on the reverse sweep. Um, it's the only it's the only leverage point he's got. So I I I, I, <laughs> I haven't I haven't seen a lot of discussion from the administration about it, but I frankly I haven't seen a lot of discussion from the administration about what their strategy is going to be on the vetoes. So um, uh, it, it remains to be seen. It will be part of part of this storm, part of the storm once the storm picks back up, part of part of how it plays out in the next few days. Uh, anything you want to tackle in the interim here while we're in the break here for four or five minutes? No, it, the capital budget is going to be interesting. I mean, the AGC's comment about what, quote, whatever it takes uh, to get the capital budget done, um, it, that that's, that's going to play several different ways. I mean, the pressure is going to be on the majority to agree with the minority on the PFD. That's one way to do whatever it takes to, to, to be able to, to get the vote on the CBR. Another another outcome of that might be, as I said, that the uh, that the the majority just opts for one of these end runs around the around the the CBR vote um, and just leaves the majority the minority sort of on an island and says, okay, well, if you guys aren't going to deal with this, we're going to take care of it another way because we have a responsibility to Alaskans and 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 here we go uh, and pass it that way. You know, the governor could veto that that approach and send it back, but it's I, it, the capital budget is a is a source of leverage. Um, even though it's a very small capital budget, because of the knock-on effect with federal funding, because of how much federal funding the state capital budget uh, uh, opens up, uh, that is a that's a source of significant, turning out to be a source of significant leverage. So, you know, maybe the judgment is that's enough, that the capital budget will be enough leverage. Uh, the governor could say he's he's going to veto any capital budget that doesn't you know doesn't use the CBR. Uh, and and sort of put pressure that way. Maybe that's but, enough leverage. But but, but in I, some fashion, the governor needs to find leverage. But see, with I'm with you because I don't. I personally don't think the capital budget is enough leverage. I mean, there's a lot of special interests involved. There's a lot of other things going on. But I personally don't think it is enough leverage. Um, and I think the governor needs to continue to you know essentially hold them to task for the operating budget because otherwise that you know if they end run him on this thing. I mean, we get one and done at this point. I mean, if there is a slip, if there is a if if anybody blinks, then you know, in my mind, looking at it now, it's over. I mean, this this you know this doesn't this doesn't end well for us in the long run, and I think that that is that's the that's the biggest problem here. Yeah, if 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 the legislature finds a way to roll the governor on the three thousand dollar PFD this year, they'll use it every year subsequent. Um, and and you're right. That'll be it. Um, so this this is this is crunch time. I, as bad as the regular session was in terms of number of issues, and gnashing of teeth and wailing, um, I think we're I think we're going to have the, the worst end of the storm, the worst end of the storm uh, coming up because it, it, there there's no way out of this. I mean, it's either it's either a full PFD, and and we go to you know talking about you know, what happens in the future beyond that, or it's not a full PFD and, and, and this, and the battle's over and it's done and, and, and we've lost the PFD. So, um, I, if it were me, I would keep all of my weapons on the table. Uh, I would keep the operating budget on the, I would keep the pressure from the operating budget. I would, I would keep the capital budget on the table. I'd keep all of my weapons on the table, uh, to get, uh, that, that $3,000 PFD. I wouldn't give any of them up. Um, but you know, I, I'm not the one making the call, I, right. but, but, but that's exactly the way I would handle it. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a sustainable budget. Um, Ben Carpenter, representative Ben Carpenter says no PFD is a plausible outcome. If leverage is the only thing causing the statutory PFD to happen. I mean, there is that true. Uh, but I mean, again, it's a start, Ben. I mean, we, we can only, we can only lead these horses to water. We can't make them drink. Um, Tim says in the chat room, this is a question, Brad, and I've got uh, less than a minute or about a minute. Brad, if we're running under previous oil taxes, would we be in the fiscal place where you're in? If we cut tax credits by half, wouldn't that alleviate the majority of our budget shortfall quickly? Uh, the answer is we would we, we would have less revenue under ACES, so we'd be in a worse shape under the previous tax structure. Uh, if we cut 
uh, all tax credits in half were essentially just were, were essentially just taking money from future generations because kind of changing the tax structure will reduce investment that'll reduce production long term and will reduce revenues long term so we're essentially just stealing from future generations by by trying to take additional taxes into this generation Brad Keithley's our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. We're working on the weekly top three. We just got done with the uh, with the vetoes and the operating budget, and now we're on to number two. Let's see if we can squeeze two and three here into the next ten minutes. Two is taxes. Brad, you say thank you for all the depression that I'm about to suffer. Taxes are inevitable on someone, and they're quite honestly already here. Yeah. So PFD cuts are taxes, right? Uh, and so we've had taxes the last couple of years. When when people argue no taxes, uh, I won't agree to any taxes. Well, we've already had taxes. I mean, we've, we've had taxes the last two years. And if you look at all four budgets uh, that have been out there, uh, and I've, I've got a chart that does this. I'll post it up after the show. Uh, but if you look at all four budgets, the governor's budget, the House budget, the Senate budget, and the conference, and the conference committee budget, uh, which folds in the House and the Senate budget, all four of those uh, run in deficit. Uh, none of them uh, balance. Even the governor's budget doesn't balance. Now, the governor initially proposed uh, a, a, a tax or, or a transfer of taxes, if you will, from local government property taxes on oil properties uh, from local government to the state, which would have put revenue, that revenue in the state's pocket at the expense of the localities would have put that revenue in the state's pocket and would have balanced out the governor's budget. So his his initial budget shows that it's balanced, but but there was no action on on the proposal to upstream the the taxes from the localities to the state. That's in a bill SB 57. There was no action on that. It didn't even get a hearing right. on the House side. I don't think it got a hearing on the Senate side either. Um, and so that's really off the table. And once you strip out that that proposed transfer, there's a deficit uh, in the governor's budget. Even using the updated numbers from the spring revenue forecast for production and for oil prices, which are better than what were that what was in the fall forecast, you still have a four hundred million dollar deficit uh, in the governor's budget. So there's going to be taxes. I mean, yeah, after after the governor after after all of this, after the storms pass, and we have a budget, there's going to be taxes. Now, the question is who the taxes are on, whether they're PFD cuts, which are taxes on current Alaskans, but but only really on middle and lower income Alaska families, uh, the top 20 percent escape, or whether they're, they are taxes on future Alaskans, which is which is the result of drawing down savings further, reducing the investment base in the permanent fund, uh, and, and as a consequence, reducing future uh, the future revenue stream from the from the permanent fund to, to future Alaskans. Um, I, there, there's a question. There's an open question about who the taxes are going to hit. But we are going to be paying taxes. Um, some Alaskans are going to be paying taxes uh, uh, to, to to fund government. There's there's no proposal on the table that gets us down to uh, spending equals revenues. So. We're there. We've been there the last two years with PFD cuts. We're there again, even under the governor's, even under this governor's budget. Um, and frankly, we we need to be talking about those revenue streams. We need to be talking about what the fair and equitable way is to raise those revenue streams, rather than having this this what I think is a wasted effort of the working group, uh, this bicameral working group on the permanent fund, which is one way of raising taxes, rather than, than focusing in on the permanent fund, we ought to be having a general discussion uh, of, of, of how we're going to raise uh, these revenues. And you know what? Once we have that discussion, once we open that door, once we start talking about taxes, and if we talk about equitable taxes that affect all Alaskans, not just middle and lower income Alaskans. Once we open that door and have that discussion, people are going to go, wait, wait, they want me to pay taxes. Right. Well, we need to get spending down. The pressure to reduce spending will, will increase. So I, the, the future is here. Somebody's going to be paying taxes for these budget deficits. 
question is who we ought to be having the discussion we ought to be starting the discussion about it now well and that's the whole thing i mean this whole this whole question could be resolved by reducing the overall spending which is again what i started the whole show with this morning this inability or unwillingness to even address this issue that's what this is all about is the uh, the just the inability or the unwillingness to tackle that one issue so if we don't do that then obviously the taxation in one form or another is inevitable. But maybe that's what it takes to get the average Alaskan's attention. You know, over the last seven years is that we've been dealing with these deficits and, and I've been working on these issues, over the last seven years, I've become convinced we are not going to reduce spending in the abstract. We can say we know we should reduce spending. We can say we know spending's the problem. But, but just the mantra of reduce spending – is not going to get spending reduced. If if it would, if it were, we would already be there. It's going to take it's going to take some push. It's going to take some eye-opening experience on Alaskans' part to really understand why they need to get behind reducing spending. <laughs> and and the and the only thing that 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 I've found in my discussions and 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 interactions that really get people to do that, really get people to open up their eyes. And to pop awake on this issue is when I is when I say, and you're going to pay taxes if we don't get it reduced. And all of a sudden it's like, well, heck, we can reduce spending at the university. We can reduce spending here. We can reduce spending there. Yes, we can, but we haven't done it. Right. Well, if I've got to pay taxes, <laughs> right, then, right, then let's do it. Maybe Hammond was right in the long, you know, in in the in, again in hindsight, maybe Hammond was right again that that income tax. You know, giving them skin in the game as a percentile was not a bad deal because what you're saying is essentially what I was saying earlier in the show. And let takes us to number three, which, of course, is the federal budget deficit, where you're saying it, you know, nothing will change until until basically we come to that catastrophic event of, hey, now you got to pay taxes in the state of Alaska on the federal level. Nothing's going to happen until the yogurt hits the wall because they're just going to keep things rolling the way that they do because, that's the status quo, and that is what's politically palatable. Nobody else wants to pull things back. We got about two minutes here, Brad. Let's tackle the federal debt in that time. I'm sure we can well, fix it. it it's uh, uh, the federal debt is is sort of in the same shape as Alaska. We're about to hit a big storm on the on the federal spending side. We're coming up against a debt li debt limit, which means that we can't issue the, the federal government's prohibited from issuing any more debt. Uh, and that'll essentially shut down government because we, we're running about 20% of our of our of our government spending is financed by debt. If we can't issue more debt, uh, we can't finance all of the spending that's that's been been authorized out there. We hit that around September October uh, that debt limit, and that's that's just going to force everybody uh, to 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 come up against the to to confront that issue. Uh, we've got federal the FY20 spending coming up. Uh, beginning uh, October one, they're going to have to talk about what the but they're ha they're talking about what the budget is next year, and we've got a, a law that's called the sequester uh, coming up uh, that will essentially force reductions in spending, uh, it, absent absent some other agreement. the 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 problem is that that all of these issues are going to hit, and there's really no game plan for how to for how to deal with them. Some people just want to say, well, we need to pass the debt limit because we can't. Have the federal government stop stop paying its bills, stop issuing debt, and stop paying its bills. But others say, well, we're not going to do that in the abstract. We've got to tie that to FY20 spending. We've got to tie that to to, to waiving the sequester again. We're we're, on, we're in a very bad trajectory uh, that that the ultimate effect of which is uh, is a government shutdown if we don't get these things resolved. Or worse yet, <laughs> there's something worse than a government shutdown. Worse yet. At the, at the last minute, the Republicans and the Democrats decide to paper over these differences by increasing spending even more. Right, which, uh, which by, is historic. By saying we're going to increase defense and, and increase non-defense spending. Right, which historically is what has happened, unfortunately. And here we sit. I'm going to give you the last word on this, brother, because I've already had my words. I, I can't even... I am, <clears throat> I am so frustrated by that whole thing. Like I said, it immediately, and I'm not a guy that gets depressed, but I immediately either fly into a rage or just a deep depression of, you know, what's the point? This thing, the, the wheels have to come off the bus before anything is going to change, in my opinion. But, you know, you may be a little more sunny side than I am on this.
Yeah, here, here's here's the really disappointing thing. We we had we had a come to Jesus moment in 2011 uh, around 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 the federal budget. Yeah, that's when the Tea Party Patriots were uh, very uh, very active. Obama was president. The Republicans controlled the Congress. There was a big confrontation. We did in fact have you know came to the point of uh, potentially uh, uh, U.S. going into default because we didn't raise the debt limit. All sorts of things were coming together, and the consequence of that. Frankly, as a compromise between the Democrat administration and the Republican Congress, was to impose these these spending limits um, and and say we're going to get spending down. We're going to we're going to drastically reduce the rate of spending uh, increase, um, and and that's how we're going to deal with it. And during the remainder of the Obama administration, between 2012 and 20 um, FY 2017, which began during the Obama administration, during the remainder of the of the Obama administration, well. Yeah, FY 2017. During the remainder of the Obama administration, deficits were coming down. Uh, they were below a trillion dollars, uh, and in fact, uh, FY the FY 18 was projected to be somewhere in the 380 million dollar billion uh, dollar range. Uh, at that point, we we had really gotten spending under control. The 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 problem is um, the last two years. With the Republicans in control of the presidency and in control of the Congress, you would think that they would have ratcheted down that spending even further. But what happened was we had an explosion in the deficit because they reduced revenues through the through the tax bill, uh, revenues dropped, and they increased spending with the with the 2017 uh, uh, spending agreement that covers FY or covers 2017 and, and 2018. So they really uh, 18 and 19. So they really uh, uh, substantially increased the problem. They undid these the, the 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 those two years. The Congress undid all of the progress that had been made uh, in 2011. So here we're coming up again on on sort of a repeat of the situation that we faced in 2011. Uh, and nobody, not even Mick Mulvaney, who was who was one of the most strident opponent or uh, proponents in 2011 for the budget deal that came out of there, nobody is saying let's go back to that budget deal, let's get our spending back under control. They're all the the, the general talk about general discussion is how much of an increase do we need to agree to <laughs> to get you know to get an agreement on 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 raising the debt limit and and the other things that need to be done. So right. the dynamics that we had it under we had it. Headed toward being in control uh, in the Budget Control Act of 2011, the dynamics that fed that though have completely disintegrated, and now we're and now even the Republican side is just you know arguing about how much how much of an increase they have to agree to. Well, and of course this is always the problem. I mean, I, you know, they're always about well, it's about compromise, and we've got to come together. We've got to. The problem is, is that this is <laughs> the road to compromise always leads us in the, it seems like, and especially in fiscal matters, always leads us to the bad direction of just always spending some kind of unsustainable level of spending. And it just, it kills me at this point. Yeah, um, we're headed back, we're headed back over trillion dollar deficits, likely this year, but certainly next year. Uh, and then, according to CBO projections, we're, we're at trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see. From that, I, it, it, we are wrecking future generations as we go. We are transferring a huge amount of debt and interest cost to future generations, constraints on, on future generations well, as we go. And, and I think I asked this, I mean, you, you mentioned it, but I mean, ostensibly we hire or we vote in these Republicans because they're supposed to be smaller government, more fiscally conservative. And historically, starting with George W. Bush and moving forward, They've been worse for the economy than anybody else. And so, I mean, why are we playing this two-party game in this? we got about a minute and a half. Yeah, it's the, so the Republicans insist on, uh, on, on uh, well, there's two things going on. One, the Republicans insist, insist on defense spending. To get the Democrats to agree to defense spending, the Republicans have to also agree to match it on the non-defense side. Um, and spending's ratcheting up that way. But frankly, one of the bigger drivers, we've talked about this on the show again and, we'll, and, and before and we will again, one of the bigger drivers is what's going on with Social Security and, and Medicare uh, sort of under our noses. There's another chart I'll publish later today that's how big, how, 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 how high the cost is expanding for Social Security and Medicare. And it's, it, it's, it's outstripped the funding mechanisms, payroll taxes, the current generation isn't paying for Social Security and Medicare. We're putting that on the credit card 
for future generations to pay. So it's a multifaceted problem. No one's tackling the problem. They're all just sort of, how do I get through this and get to the next election? And then I'll go campaign for a while and tell everybody I'm going to fix it. And then I'll go back and make it worse. I mean, nobody's tackling this problem. We, we, need, we need a Ross Perot back. Right. In 1992, we had Ross Perot who really focused the nation on the national debt. The consequence of that was was a Clinton presidency and, and a Newt Gingrich Congress that actually produced budget surpluses in the late 1990s. That was a consequence of Ross Perot bringing focus to it in the, 19, in, in the 1992 election. We need that back. We need somebody bringing this issue back. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. I've got the U.S. debt clock up right now. You can look at it just ticking away. $22.386 trillion right now and just clicking away at the rate of about $50,000 a second. And uh, that's what we have, and uh, that's that's where we're going. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board and joining us today. As always, my friend, it is a pleasure to speak with you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.